asking. Um, for uh, this is just sort of apropos nothing and, and kind of surprising, but did people see that Bill Gates bought the Seattle Times this morning? No. Yeah, he buys it every morning. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be here. All, I'll be here all night. Um, so uh, hopefully you have come for the state of aquatic animal advocacy. Uh, as the uh, introductory sort of blurb about this panel mentions, uh, there are about 100 billion fin fish who are killed every single year for food, as well as 350 to 400 billion shellfish, uh, including shrimp. So it is an overwhelming number of animals, and they are treated basically like inanimate objects. So we've seen a lot of movement uh, in, in the animal welfare movement um, on behalf of other animals, vanishingly little on behalf of aquatic animals. So uh, extremely important. Um, and as we'll be discussing in a minute, we think also uh, neglected and tractable. And we'll be talking about some of the tractable solutions. So uh, we're gonna start with uh, about a 10 minute uh, presentation from Sofika with the Aquatic Life Institute. Uh, and then we will have a panel discussion there will be time for questions, so please go to the swap card and start entering your questions. And uh, please also go to the swap card and upvote the questions that you're most interested in hearing us discuss. Uh, without further ado, I would like to, Sofika will introduce herself uh, and sort of level set the state of aquatic animal advocacy. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Sofika Kostniuk, Managing Director at Aquatic Life Institute. Absolutely thrilled to be here with you. Um, I am very new, actually, to the animal welfare space and the EA space overall. This is my first EA event ever, so I'm quite honored to be on this wonderful panel and to be opening up this session. Um, I am, however, absolutely not a stranger to ocean conservation advocacy and uh, corporate engagement, policy reform, and so forth. For the last 20 years, I've been in the nonprofit world and uh, engaging corporations, anyone from Target to Zara to Safeway, um, to ensure that their sustainability policies are stronger and that those policy commitments are actually um, holding those corporations accountable. So I have also worked with um, the government of California to introduce the first ever organic seafood labeling bill and uh, engaged in grassroots mobilization across Canada. I have to say though, when animal welfare came onto my radar only last summer in terms of aquatic animal advocacy, um, I was floored. I was embarrassed, frankly, that this was an issue that I hadn't tackled in my last 20 years of work in the sustainability field. So it hooked me in and um, the, rest, the rest is history and this is how I've landed on the stage today. So I'll just share some information with you about the state of aquatic animal advocacy at present. This is still a very new um, sector, I would say, in the animal welfare movement but a critically, critically important one. 100 billion. 350 to 400 billion. Two to three trillion with a capital T. What on earth are these numbers referring to? It's really the scale of the problem that we're grappling with, with regard to aquatic animal advocacy. This is a highly neglected, highly tractable, and highly urgent matter that requires a lot of attention right now. So you're probably familiar with some of the most common farmed fish, carp, tilapia, salmon, trout, perch, but there are over a hundred species that are farmed around the world. For shrimp, the work that Andres and his group is working on, he'll speak to you about that, is white leg and black tiger prawns are the predominant species. And then the, in the wild, honestly, it's anything that swims. So arguably, um, wild caught fish lead a life of greater well-being as compared to farmed fish. The duration of suffering 
is very condensed, but it's irrefutable that the intensity of suffering from the time of capture to the time and manner of slaughter is almost incomprehensible. The majority of these individuals, highly sentient individuals, are eviscerated, mutilated, dismembered, um, asphyxiated, and or crushed to death. Completely unacceptable and something that I had not been considering in the prior 20 years of work that I've been doing. This issue can no longer be ignored. When you couple that with the size of the global seafood trade and the complexity of it, there could be a farm salmon that's grown in Scotland, sent over to China for processing. Part of that fish stays in Asia. Another part of that fish, the fillets, will get sent back to Europe or to the US to be sold in grocery stores. And then other parts of that fish will get reduced into fertilizer, nutraceuticals, fish oil, fish meals, pet food for your cats and dogs. How do we tackle such a complicated global system? So step one was to amass all the information, all the data, all the research that existed, as well as conduct some novel EA-based research. This work began in 2019 through the Aquatic Life Institute and a number of our really, really critical animal welfare partners that have experience in this space. And we came up with these five key welfare pillars for aquaculture. Over 80 groups from around the world and key stakeholders signed on to these pillars. The language is the same. The messaging is the same. There is coordination across the movement. This allows the movement to expedite change. Really, really important. Just this March, we released key welfare pillars for wild capture fisheries for those two to, tri two to three trillion fish. Um, and again, this is focused mostly on capture, slaughter, and you can also see bycatch issues and uh, abandoned fishing gear or ghost gear. Another 80 groups, many of them the same as from the uh, aquaculture space also signed on. This is extraordinary. So now we have the research well underway. More research is required, but we're, we're on the right path. So there's research. Then we have to start building power to create the change. The Aquatic Animal Alliance is a group of nearly 90 member organizations from around the world. And it was intentionally designed not to only represent the global north, because then we're putting blinders on and missing a huge part of the conversation and the issues. We're doing OK in this space, but clearly we need to invest more time and energy to bring on organizations and individuals from Africa, South America, the Middle East, and so forth. Many of the member groups are listed here around the sides of the map. Many are not. And I apologize if your organization didn't show up here with the logo, but it was simply a matter of space limitations. Um, but this really helps us understand neglected areas, neglected species, neglected voices, and neglected organizations. Really critical to creating change globally. So the research is underway. The power is getting built. Where do you focus that power? This is essentially our theory of change. There's no magic bullet to where an organization or an effort shows up in this pyramid. Um, and groups like Andres with Shrimp Welfare Project, the Fish Welfare Initiative, they tend to focus their efforts and energy at that fisherman farmer level. So working with the producers on the ground, really, really critical work to build those deep relationships and then create change on the ground. Aquatic Life Institute and Aquatic Animal Alliance collectively, we focus on those top two tiers, global governance, as well as certifiers. So you might ask yourself, why certifiers? In the seafood space, certifiers cover approximately 43% of all global volume of aquaculture 
and wild capture fish. They're a key lever point in the supply chain. Another place, so global policy, there have been some recent really, really exciting wins. I don't know if anyone from Crustacean Compassion is here, but bravo to them. So on April 7th, they were able to successfully, after a long, hard push, get the UK Animal Welfare Bill through. And this one covers cephalopod and decapod sentience, which is extraordinary and novel. And uh, that is setting up other efforts, like the future cephalopod farming ban, setting it up for success. Again, this alignment, sharing ideas, sharing wins. So we have the research, we have building the power, we have our targets, our focus. What if people still want to consume seafood? Which they do, and seafood consumption continues to rise year over year across the globe. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization in 2020 put out a statement that 20.1 kilograms of seafood were consumed per person per year. I can't imagine that myself, but that is their statistic and that number is on the rise. So what do we do? Well, there's a really, really exciting, innovative new industry, alternative seafood. So um, fish and shellfish-like products that are derived from plants or grown in a lab from cells, this is starting to take hold. Private investment in this space between 20 and 2021 in the US nearly doubled to 175 million US dollars per year. That's extraordinary and really exciting. When we think about what's been happening in the plant-based meat space, where presently 1.4% of all US meat sales are plant-based, this gives incredible opportunity to alternative seafood to also follow that same track. So stay tuned and, and see what's going on in this space. So to wrap up, I'll just say, well, these are my wonderful fellow presenters, so I can't wait to have them join me on the stage. But to create the change that's needed at scale, we really need a global village of diverse voices. We really need expertise. We need sharing. We need collaboration to create, again, the change that's needed at scale. We also need significant investment in this sector to allow it to grow to allow capacity to increase so that billions upon billions upon billions of individual sentient aquatic animals can begin to enjoy a life of well-being. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, super fascinating. Um, all right, so we're gonna have uh, a fireside chat with the four of us. Um, I'll start by asking uh, Andres and Alex to say a few words about who they are and how they got here uh, and what they're doing now. Then we'll have some, uh, just some discussion um, and then uh, we will have question and answer from all of you based on the swap card. Um, and a few final closing comments from each panelist. But um, so Andres, if you wanna just introduce yourself and then Alex, and then I'll have a question for Sofika and then we'll um, have a conversation. Thank you, Bruce. Can you hear me? Um, great. So um, my name is Andres Jimenez Zorrilla. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I am the CEO and co-founder of Shrimp Welfare Project. Um, we are an organization which um, focuses on improving the lives of billions of shrimps, farm shrimps worldwide. And um, I'm very happy to be here to present to you uh, with, with these co-panelists. Thank you. Excellent, we're happy to have you. Alex. Thanks, Bruce. Also super happy to be here. Um, I'm Alex Holst. I work on the Good Food Institute's Europe's policy team trying to convince governments to support the alternative seafood sector that Sofika introduced. All right, excellent. Um, so, uh, Sofika, uh, the first question I wanted to ask, um, when I chat with people about aquatic animal welfare, um, 
generally, the first question is, why should we care about aquatic animals? Um, so can you chat a little bit about uh, the science around sentience slash consciousness, et cetera, um, with regard to aquatic animals? Where are we? Um, and so you did a, a phenomenal job, I think, of laying out the insanity of the suffering and the degree to which aquatic animals are treated like inanimate objects. Um, why shouldn't they be treated like inanimate objects? Yeah, it's a wonderful question, and I have to be honest with you, that particular question baffles me. Aquatic species have been around far longer than any other animal on land. So naturally, they have developed extraordinary um, skill sets, they're highly intelligent, they're just not necessarily cute and fuzzy and relatable to, to us humans, as is a cow, a pig, a sheep, a, a chicken. Um, there, there are volumes, there's volumes of information in terms of the sentience um, of most, like most large um, and, and some smaller aquatic species. So if anyone here has seen my octopus feature, um, I think it's irrefutable that these, um, these beings are incredibly sentient, they're intelligent, they're interactive, they sense fear, they sense pain. Um, and, you know, aggression. So um, it, it really is irrefutable. The, the evidence continues to mount. Um, and I think that it would be a little bit um, quite inappropriate for us, actually, as humans, to think that other, other individuals that we simply haven't understood how to relate to are non-sentient. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and Andres, um, I have a couple of questions for you, but the, the sure. first one is, can you take a, a swing at the question that I just asked Sofika as well, specifically sure. with regard to shrimp? Yes, um, absolutely. I think a, a lot of people are, are dubious. Um, they might go, okay, you know, thin fish, yeah. sentience, like I can, I can see that tuna weigh 600 pounds or something, like I can relate to them, like I can yeah. relate to a cow or a colossally sized dog. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but shrimp, I'm a little, I'm a little less clear yeah. on shrimp sentience. Absolutely. That's a very good question, and thanks for asking it. I think um, we need to be mindful that a lot of the um, science uh, and certainty around sentience of mammals, for example, are derived from extrapolating the sentience and the, and the uh, assumption of con consciousness of animals who have been uh, extensively um, studied, like mice, for example. And if we take that example and use it with, um, for example, shrimps, um, it, which is exactly what they did in the London School of Economics research paper that was published recently as part of the sentience bill that Sofika mentioned. There's um, extensive evidence of sentience for uh, octopus, and there's extensive um, evidence for uh, crabs. And what the, what the scientists have done is apply the same principle of a precautionary principle, basically extending the, the evidence of octopus to the rest of the cephalopods and crabs to the rest of the decapods. Um, and the reason why there, I believe, some of us are um, dubious about the, the sentience of these animals, it's not because there is evidence of a lack of sentience, but rather there's lack of evidence because they haven't been sufficiently studied. Um, but I invite everyone to look at that paper. It's, it's really informative. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, I have been telling people um, precautionary principle with regard to, to shellfish, including uh, shrimp for, I guess, like 35 years now. And uh, a lot of people are, are far more interested uh, in saying, I'm gonna wait until it's absolutely proven yeah. and I'm gonna keep eating them until then. Um, with some people, I'm able to convince them on the basis of talking about environmental yeah. concerns. Um, and I, I'd be interested in if you could um, briefly reprise uh, the environmental concerns um, around, um, especially, I think, uh, wild captured shrimp. Yeah. Um, and then also, like, tactically, uh, to what degree does Shrimp Welfare Project lean into um, environmental versus animal versus some amalgam? Um, of the two yeah. when, you're, uh, when you're working to make things better. Great. 
Uh, thanks for the question. So one big caveat, uh, our um, area of expertise really focuses more on farm shrimp uh, rather than, than wild capture. But um, we also look at the issue of, of wild caught shrimp. And I think the, the main um, issues from an environmental perspective with wild caught shrimp is just um, bycatch, as Sofika was mention, uh, mentioning, trawling and, and essentially just wiping out the, the seabed uh, floor, which, which um, liberates uh, gigatons of, of, uh, of um, greenhouse gases. And then um, with, with regards to other shrimp practices to, to grow these animals, in aquaculture, there, there's mangrove um, deforestation, um, acidification, and, and just ruining the soil to grow uh, other vegetables around, uh, around shrimp farming. Those would be the biggest concerns. Whether we lean into this, into this um, so far we haven't, because we are focusing on uh, working collectively with farmers, and farmers are much more receptive um, to messages around health and prevention of disease. But I think as a, as a global strategy to protect um, shrimps and to improve the, the, the way that these animals are either raised or captured, I think it's a, it's a very good angle. And I think it's one that actually um, Aquatic Life Institute touches upon um, very, uh, very concretely. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Alex, uh, can you chat a little bit? Um, so, uh, Sofika previewed it, but if you could go a little bit more deeper, more deeply um, into alternative seafood's role in alleviating aquatic animal suffering. Yeah, sure. Um, as Sofika mentioned, uh, we've seen over the last few years really a rise in developing alternative seafood. So, seafood made from plants or cultivated directly from cells. Um, and the numbers Sofika showed, um, investment doubling last year over the previous one, makes us very hopeful. But we have to say um, the sector is still at its earliest stages. Um, alternative seafood has the potential to really satisfy that rising global demand for seafood. Um, and wild fisheries are depleted. The United Nations says now 90% of all wild fisheries are either, either overexploited or at maximum capacity. And so how governments and countries tend to react to that, they try to boost aquaculture. Of course, aquaculture comes with all the challenges, um, Sofika, that you mentioned. Um, and alternative seafood really here is an alternative to deliver the same taste, the same texture, the same price um, that conventional seafood does. Great, thank you. Um, so I think across various animal protection conversations, there's kind of a, to some degree, debate, um, but certainly for anybody who's thinking and getting interested, is interested in working um, in animal protection, there's gonna be a question about, do I go bottom up with consumers or do I go top down with industry? That oftentimes has a fair amount of uh, overlap with the question of welfare for animals versus abolition um, of animal use. Um, and I'd be interested in, in each of, you know, how your organizations um, attack this problem. And maybe starting with you, uh, Andres, I mean, obviously you, you name checked that you're working on welfare. Maybe a little bit of your thinking around why sure. you're working on welfare and how you think about these questions. Sure, um, thanks for the, for the question. I think it's important to overlay the, the, the geographic dynamics uh, to, the, to the shrimp market and, and I think to, to the seafood market in, in general. Um, about 70% of the seafood is produced in, in Asia. If we focus on aquaculture, it's about 80%. Um, there's about 60 million jobs that are uh, generated through, uh, from fisheries and, and aquaculture, and about 85% of those are in Asia. Whereas a, lo a significant portion of the production is then it's exported to Europe, uh, about 35% to, to the US, about 15%, and to Japan. So in my opinion, there's naturally different types of works, work that should be done in different regions. So in, in, in our view, uh, Asia requires a lot of welfare work and, and working with, with the producers because it's mostly comprised of very small farmers who own less than, or who produce in less than uh, one hectare ponds. 
whereas I believe that in consuming countries, um, Europe, US, Japan, it uh, provides um, some of the work that, that uh, ALI is doing, for example, with um, certifiers, potentially legislation change, particularly around trade, um, provides more leverage. So I, th I think there's um, different work that needs to be done in different areas and it needs to be attacked from all angles. And we focus on, on working on working with uh, producers because we feel that it's, it's an area that in particular in, in Asia is highly neglected. We are one of the very few organizations along with Fish Welfare Initiative who are uh, working on, with this approach. Yeah, I find uh, both your work and, and the Fish Welfare Initiative work uh, to be so fascinating because you actually do have sort of a, a pitch uh, to fish farmers that this will be better for them and better uh, for fish and shrimp, uh, which just seems uh, super fascinating and valuable. And, and you sort of uh, nodded at that concept in just a, sec uh, just a moment ago. Um, I'm curious if you could just re reflect on the scalability of what you're doing. So you're doing it in a fairly limited geography. Um, it feel like I could imagine pitching your welfare standards to sort of global trade groups um, and actually convincing them to adopt your welfare standards, uh, both for their PR, uh, but also because it is actually in the interest of the, the farmers to do the work that you're encouraging them to do. Um, how are you thinking about, you know, your work, you know, for lack of a better framing, a sort of pilot project for global shrimp welfare improvement? I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, the way, the way I, I see the, the work of, of um, collaborating with farmers is precisely as a proof of concept to the large buyers in, in, the, in the consuming countries that such higher welfare aquatic animals can be produced and that it is um, also in the interest of, uh, of the small farmers. So for, for, for just to throw an example, if farmers can grow larger shrimps, they can sell those at a price premium per kilo and, and make more profits. Uh, and that has a, a positive impact on the welfare of the animals by um, the farmers needing to care for them um, in a more and more attentively and growing them for longer, thereby decreasing the number of harvests and therefore the number of animals. So yeah, I, I do see us as a, as a proof of concept so that eventually when, when consumer awareness and corporate outreach work eventually comes to these species, um, the production can actually meet those commitments that demand and, and avoid some of the um, blockages that have been faced by, by other species. Great. And so Fika, for the sort of broader coalition work, um, as well as for your organization, um, how are you thinking about this sort of um, top down versus bottom up and to the degree that you see the, the overlap that I'm suggesting there might be. Um, also the question of sort of uh, welfare versus just stop eating them because they're sentient. Um, I thought you, you answered the question of their sentience like super effectively. Um, and obviously a lot of people, um, especially sort of diehard animal rights people would say, well, people just shouldn't eat them. Um, so how do, you, how do you think about that you know, for your org and for the entire movement? And actually but think about that for a second. Um, if, would you mind, uh, the, uh, the swap card has vanished for me, so if you wouldn't mind coming up and, and helping me with that, um, I would appreciate it. And do get your questions in on the swap card. In a moment, I'll be able to see them, um, and we'll go to those in, in probably about um, five minutes. We'll do uh, some of those, so, so Fika. So um, just to reiterate the question, top-down versus bottom-up approach, and how does this whole system work? Is that, okay. Um, so as mentioned, Aquatic Life Institute and the Aquatic Animal Alliance, we primarily focus on certifiers. So we've been working with five of the largest aquaculture certifiers in the world for the last year and a half or so, which include um, ASC, Aquatic Stewardship Council, the BAP, Best Aquaculture Practices, Natureland, um, and, and a few others, friend, Friends of the Sea. And uh, these certifiers, because they're so global in scope, so farming is 
decentralized a lot of the time unless there are cooperatives or clusters that form a larger corporation or go to a specific buyer. Um, but these certifiers certify tens of thousands of farms at a time if we're talking about shrimp, for example. We feel that it is an incredibly um, strategic lever point, again, in the supply chain to work with those certifiers to either strengthen their welfare standards or introduce new welfare modules specific to carp, specific to shrimp, specific to salmon, because all of these species have unique requirements at different life stages, but also just unique requirements because they're different from, from each other. Um, but to introduce and or strengthen that language, because as soon as that standard language changes, it's actually required for anyone who enjoys that label to meet the standard. They'll have a year to a year and a half, whatever the, the specific timeline is with that certifier to implement the standard change, but then they will be audited by a third party auditor. And if they don't meet those new requirements, they stand to lose that label and stand to lose their access to the market. So it is enforceable and traceable that way. From the global policy perspective, very often it's not necessarily regulated, but it sets the tone for country level policy, which then can be regulated for um, large buyer policy, which then holds those large buyers accountable by the consumers. So as Andres said, it really is a multi-pronged approach that's required and one that is already in effect. And you know, each tier of that pyramid interrelates with all the others and they support each other. Great, thank you. Um, and Alex, for the Good Food Institute, um, if you, I mean, you can take this question wherever you want, but, uh, but basically GFI, thank you, um, works on top down predominantly, I believe, but how are you, how do you think about bottom up? Um, so you've uh, talked a little bit about where alternative seafood is from a sort of companies starting and tech development vantage. Uh, to what degree does convincing consumers that they should actually eat um, or support plant-based and cultivated um, alternatives. Feels like that might be a little bit harder with uh, van terrestrial animals because seafood gets you know, pretty strong health props. Um, so how does, uh, how does GFI and GFI Europe uh, think about these questions? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, it's definitely the case that um, there is less of a perception that there are negative health um, implications from seafood than maybe with uh, red meat, especially processed meat. Um, and so one priority for lots of these alternative seafood producers is to make sure that the nutritional quality of their products is on par with um, the conventional seafood products. Um, but in the end, um, consumer behavior change, diet change is really hard. Um, we need to try to do it, but it's hard. So that's why GFI really focuses on changing the way we produce seafood, making alternative seafood competitive with conventional seafood on taste, on price and on convenience. Um, and we've made some good progress, but um, we are really not there yet. So that's why GFI is focusing on working with producers, with food manufacturers, with startups, working with scientists and researchers across the world, and with policymakers to um, advance the sector. We need more research, we need more innovation, we need support, supportive policies. Um, and there um, we think we can have the biggest impact because in the end, most consumers who like seafood it's probably very hard to convince them to give it up over the next decade. So we need to reach them, and them we only reach um, with an appealing product. Great. All right, I'm going to ask uh, one more question uh, and then go to audience questions from swap cards. So please vote up the questions you most want to hear responses to. Um, and then, uh, then we'll close out uh, with final words from, from each of the panelists. Uh, but Sofika, I was um, fascinated when I first saw your slide with the massive numbers of organizations that had signed on uh, to the idea of aquatic animal welfare. Um, it's still my impression looking at um, all of the organizations that had signed on that um, a lot of them have signed on and, and as far as I'm aware are doing nothing other than having signed on to the coalition. Um, thinking about this in terms of neglectedness, um, I think we have, have really nailed, at least from my perspective, I'm pretty sympathetic, but 
I feel like we've nailed importance, uh, both the fact that we should care and that the suffering is, is pretty overwhelming. Um, and I think tractability is pretty clear as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about neglectedness? And you can talk about it in terms of overall cause areas, um, but I'm actually thinking more specifically um, in the context of, of people who care about animals and already recognize animals are important. Um, what's the resource allocation and, and why does it deserve more? So resource allocation from investments and just attention, you're saying, to, to this particular animal welfare issue? Yeah, I mean, it, you could look at the slide that you put up with like all of the organizations mm -hmm. that have signed on um, and think, wow, this is like a powerhouse of organizations like really focused on aquatic animal welfare. Mm -hmm. um, is that impression right? Um, and yeah, I mean, it, just in terms of a neglectedness analysis, is this neglected? Is this not neglected? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Yeah, um, so it is a great question and you are absolutely bang on. Not all of those organizations and probably not even the majority of them spend much of their time at all on aquatic animal welfare. That is inconsequential because in principle, they support animal welfare writ large, just like I can support animal welfare for a cow, a pig, a sheep, a, a chicken, and so on. Um, so the alliance was built on the open wing alliance model. It's non-binding, the Aquatic Animal Alliance, but what it does is demonstrates the power of collectives. So um, even though those organizations aren't necessarily acting in that space on a daily basis, they support the principle. Um, and they will support calls to action. They will support calls to reform policy. All of that matters, all of it matters. Um, and you know, this is really demonstrating the power of movement building that when required, we know we have an incredible network that we can call upon to support um, the work that either we or a cluster of those organizations are putting forward. There is trust, there is collaboration, there is openness, um, there's sharing of information and webinars in advance of presenting something significant to either policy, um, for policy reform or to certifiers. So there's transparency in the process. This is how um, movements are shaped and built. And so it's, it, I think it's absolutely wonderful. And I, you know, we very happily regularly support other calls to action from member organizations in spaces where we don't operate regularly, but we share the same values and the, the same kind of goals for the future. Right. Um, yeah, that's certainly, uh, it's been my impression in working on this panel, the sort of collaborativeness um, of the organizations working on aquatic animal welfare, I think is really uh, worthy of emulation and, and extraordinarily impressive, just the total focus on, on uh, mission. Um, Andres, Alex, did, did either of you want to add 30 to 45 seconds of uh, addition to what Sofika just said? Yes, uh, I'd love to. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, so I, I, I do feel that some of these uh, large um, organizations, there is an opportunity for um, aquatic animals to be um, higher up in the list of priorities, but particularly in, in my case, I talk about shrimp, but I think I, I, I it's more aquatic animals in general. I think as the progress with regards to other species, with the Better Chicken campaign and, and the uh, cage-free campaign, I think as that um, progress is achieved in certain jurisdictions, I think that will open uh, a spot for aquatic animals to take a more prominent uh, space in the corporate outreach work, for example, and, and potentially consumer awareness. I think it's important that that happens. Right. Um, so we have, um, we have uh, limited time and a lot of great questions. Um, so uh, we'll ask folks to, to keep uh, answers fairly brief if possible. We'll see how many of these we can run through. Um, so uh, the first question um, tied for the most upvotes so far um, is where is the best place <clears throat> to put more funding into aquatic work right now? And uh, you should feel absolutely free to do a room for more funding in your organization if you would like. 
um, but, uh, but also to the degree that you have uh, thoughts outside your organization uh, would also be uh, very, very wonderful. And I will uh, start with you, Alex. Sure. Um, within the alternative seafood space, there is a huge need for both private investment, but also investment and funding to get the public, to get governments on board. And I think that's the area where I'm the most excited. Um, at GFI, we um, cover a range of programmatic areas, including science. So we have a research grant program where we give grants to scientists across the world to advance the science of alternative seafood. And with those research results, we can go back to governments and we can tell governments, here, look, what your scientists did with like a modest amount of funding and convince them to pour millions and millions into that kind of research. And that kind of leverage, I think, is where there is a huge opportunity um, in this space. All right, I've got a follow-up here specifically for you, Alex, and then I'll go to uh, Andres and Sofika on, the, on that last question. Um, somebody asked, is there a reason, whoops, it just vanished, is there a reason why firm, the fermented sector of, the alternative, of alternative so seafood is so much smaller than plant-based and cultivated? So they're in the neglectedness category. That's an excellent question. Um, there is one company, um, Corn, which um, many of you, if you are from the UK, will be very familiar with, that has been on the market. And that's Q-U-O-R-N. There you go, thank you. Um, that has had actually a fermented uh, alternative seafood product on the market for quite a while, but we have seen very little new product introductions in this space. I couldn't tell you the exact reason. Um, and we have also just last year seen two companies, one in France, moving into the space using fermentation um, to create um, from mycelia, so from mushrooms, a protein that um, biomimics the structure of a whole cut fish. So we've seen some, some move in this sector, um, but you're right, cultivated seafood, really growing seafood from cells directly and plant-based seafood has seen most of the attraction. Excellent. All right, Andres, uh, room for more funding for Shrimp Welfare Project as well as uh, other best places to put more funding for aquatic animal welfare. Yeah, so it's the shameless plug, I, I do think that we are a good place to put your, your money to, to support aquatic animals, but there are other organizations that are doing great work, some of which you have right here represented. Um, is it about naming names of people who I think are doing valuable work? If that's the case, I think some of the large EA-aligned animal organizations are carrying, are in increasing their, um, uh, their work with regards to aquatic animals. So your usual names are a good bet. You, you can check their websites, but there's also Crustacean Compassion that um, is doing great work with um, including cephalopods and decapods into the, into the UK sentience bill, and they're expecting to continue to, to do that. Um, Eurogroup for Animals is doing re great work in the European Union. Um, and then Fish Welfare Initiative, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan. Um, Equalia in, in Spain, Essere Animali in Italy, they're all um, doing great work with, with regards to an, uh, aquatic animals. Great. And uh, Sofika, as you answer this question, I'll, I'll also ask you to cover, um, even outside of the groups, um, and I think Andres did a really nice job of sort of summarizing um, groups active in this area and feel free to pick up any that, that he missed. But um, in addition to room for more funding uh, for your organization, are there things that maybe we haven't discussed or thought about uh, that feel to you like white spaces in the overall category of, of uh, taking aquatic animal suffering seriously? Yeah, um, so kudos to Andres for, for listing all those orgs. I support all of them. I mean, go look at that map with all those organizations that are involved. As long as there is a clear plan, a strategy, a timeline, people are really devoted um, to creating change in this space. So yes, you know, of course, Aquatic Life Institute needs and wants more funding to grow our capacity so that we can scale up, but we need to benefit the entire movement overall. So if you're more interested in um, funding abolitionist work, there's lots of projects underway in that regard. If you're more interested in funding partnerships and innovation, there's lots of opportunities for that type of funding. Um, the way that I look at it, really, there are three primary, plus now a fourth, alternative seafoods spaces that I, I believe require the most amount of funding attention. 
One is policy, ongoing policy reform. Uh, two is continued research in this space to keep building that body of evidence. And three is to um, continue building those global alliances so that the power is there, the representation is there, and all of that can be leveraged and deployed at appropriate points in time. The white space, um, yeah, I, well, you know, it's, it's something that we are really committed to pursuing, even though we don't have dedicated funding for this yet, but the cephalopod farming, so the first octopus farm is set to potentially be permitted in the Canary Islands later on this fall. Highly problematic, extremely delicate, extremely solitary species um, to be farmed en masse. Um, I, I mean, it's just riddled with problems <laughs> and concerns, even the concept. Um, so from an abolitionist standpoint, interventionist standpoint, I think that um, it's, it's really upon all of us to ensure that farms like this, new species, don't begin to, to be exploited. Um, so there's, there's a real opportunity to create change there before the problems um, arise in real time. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, there are a couple questions along these lines, um, and the one I'm reading is, how does public concern for aquatic life vary between countries and regions? Um, and I'm gonna broaden it a little bit just to say, to, to ask about relevant geographic dynamics to alleviate aquatic animal suffering. Um, and Andres, I will start with you uh, to talk about uh, geographical dynamics and uh, concern for aquatic life Perfect. regionally, geographically. Thank you. Um, so with, with regards to the geographic dynamics, I think some of them I had touched upon earlier, Asia is by far the largest producer, um, both generally about uh, seafood and, and about 90% with, with um, farmed seafood. Um, consumers are um, Europe, US. So the work um, is, is different um, in my opinion. It's working in Asia, working collaboratively with farmers, um, uh, husbandry laws, and in the consuming countries, mainly doing legislation and, and trade. I think that can provide a lot of leverage to um, change indirectly the way that the, the practices that are followed in the, in the producing countries. Because if you know, there's, there's great legislation being passed or supported to increase the standards at w on which the, these animals are, are produced in, in Europe, UK, US, um, but if that can be applied to trade, that could potentially have a, a much uh, more expansive reach. Um, with regards to concern uh, about the welfare of the animals, consumer concern, um, we have done some um, preliminary uh, scoping work and um, we see that there is um, greater concern in, in Northern Europe than in Southern Europe, for example. We've, we've focused exclusively in Europe. Um, but once, once the consumers have seen some information uh, comparing between their, their prior assumptions, a bit of information, and then their, their um, reaction to that, we've seen that people would be prepared in principle to pay significant premiums for higher welfare animals. So we're very hopeful about that. Great, and Sofika, um, anything uh, that you would like to add to the question about geographical concern and geographical uh, issues with working on these issues? Yeah, absolutely, so, so two quick things. One, um, even though I mentioned that certifiers cover around 43% of all production globally, it tends to be in those more sort of commercialized, industrialized spaces. So small scale operators, extremely decentralized, very difficult to regulate and monitor, that's, that's where it becomes really, really critical for on the ground organizations, Fish Welfare Initiative, Shrimp Welfare Project, to actually come to that same place, meet the people, meet them in that space, help them work through issues because um, a sort of the higher level of governments and oversight and regulation doesn't touch down on the ground. So, so we see differences, um, Africa, Asia, parts of South America. The other, the other point that I'd like to make is that 
really aquatic animal welfare is such a young movement that we are seeing incredible passion for this issue popping up all over the place in real time. So we're connecting with groups like Vegetariano Soy in Chile that have just discovered that the Chilean constitution looks like it's going to be opening up in the next few months and animal welfare might be able to get inserted into the constitution. That's transformative. Um, so it's just, you know, keeping eyes and ears open, keeping the conversations going, providing support, sharing information, sharing expertise when opportunities arise, because it's just, it's, it's like popcorn all over the planet right now. All right. Um, and then Alex, I know GFI operates uh, in India, Israel, Brazil, Asia Pacific, Europe, US. Um, are any of these particular sweet spots uh, for alternative seafood um, across the sort of three production uh, platforms or where are you finding sympathy or the opposite of sympathy? Um, where are things uh, most advanced? How do you think about uh, geography uh, and, uh, and sea life? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, if you slice it um, by looking at uh, where the companies, where the startups are that are developing alternative seafood, Globally, around 120. Um, in the US and North America, we have about 30, 35, similar number in Europe. Um, and then we have a cluster in Southeast Asia and East Asia. Um, if we think about concern, um, back to that question, um, I can speak mostly about Europe. And there, I would say, geographically, we have a higher recognition um, on, the, on the side of policymakers and governments that fish welfare is something they might ought to be concerned about. But I would say it's still um, a fairly niche and low, um, low lowly um, topic that's not really perceived as, as, as important as other animal welfare concerns. So when we talk to governments, we really try to convince them to put large sums of money into alternative seafood research. We go via the health arguments, the environmental arguments, because those are the ones um, that they can relate to more. Um, and I think that is strategically which, which each organization has to figure out um, how can we really relate to what the governments, what the companies, what the fishermen um, that we talk to really care about, and then make our case accordingly. Yeah, so I'm, I'm bummed that uh, I think that this is going to likely be the last question. There are a ton of really um, amazing questions here. So um, if we don't get to your question, please reach out to the panelists individually and I think we might have a, a little bit of time after this panel for people to uh, be chatted with one-on-one. -on -one. So um, here's the last question, and then there'll be sort of, uh, I'll ask a closing question, although on the closing question, you can not answer it and say whatever you want, want by way of closing, but hopefully it's a good wrap up. Uh, last question is, do you see opportunities for reducing the use of fish as animal feed, fish feed, which might be easier to scale or replace by new technology, for example, fermented protein, than human consumption, which requires taste parity, which feed applications do not require. Um, so that's, uh, I think, probably gonna be mostly a question for Alex, but fish feed um, is, I think, in terms of uh, fish welfare, a really big uh, question that can be pretty easily adapted uh, for, for all of the panelists. But uh, since it is sort of a, a fish feed versus uh, alternative seafood question, um, I'll start with Alex um, and then uh, Sofika and Andres. Uh, to answer you know, whatever variant on that question you would like. Sure, uh, it's a really great question. And I think I will leave it to Sufika and Andres to answer like the, the, imp the welfare implications of fish feed. One thing I think we have to be mindful of is that while this might be a, an incremental um, step in the right direction, um, all the harms associated with aquaculture that come from nutrient pollution, that come from the greenhouse gases that are emitted um, from aquaculture, um, and you mentioned, Andres, um, with shrimp farming, if the aquaculture farms are displacing mangroves, mangroves are incredibly good sequestration machines for carbon. That carbon goes into the atmosphere and is uh, increasing climate change. All of those negative effects, they still exist. I mean, so I think when we try to um, really make a case that alternative proteins need to be scaled up, we try to focus on alternative proteins for food in order to reduce the total number of aquatic animals that are slaughtered, that are farmed for food. Great. Sofika? Yeah, so, so the, the question um, 
in response to your question is, why are we feeding fish other fish? So fish meal, fish oil doesn't go to feed all forms of fish. It's really those carnivores and the shrimp, for example. So they tend to be the larger fin fish, the more sort of high end, uh, high end production aquaculture species that aren't really being produced to feed a hungry world. So that's, that's a really, really important point. Um, if we can begin to scale back the production of those large carnivorous, highly in resource intensive fish, then um, the small fish, so it's usually um, anchovies, sardines, mackerel, the forage fish that are very high in omega-3 content, oils and so on, that are caught off the coast of Peru, for example, and then reduced into this fish meal, fish oil. If those fish are still going to be caught, they really should um, be utilized to their highest potential, which would be to feed a hungry world, not to feed sort of elite fin fish that are going to feed someone in, in the US, um, for example. So I think reducing the volume of those large fin fish, carnivorous fin fish, focusing on, refocusing that effort on smaller scale production, vegetarian fish, more localized production, will begin to curb that 20 to 25% of all of those wild fish that are getting just ground up and used for other applications. So I think, I think that's a really important place um, for organizations, for policy to show up and address. Great. Do you want to add anything to Sofika's response to that, Andres? Yes, I, I completely agree because there's, there is a concern, at least there is a concern that I have, that feed is the, the highest percentage of cost <laughs> by, by a very wide margin, in, in aquaculture at least. And part of that is because it has fish, fish feed and fish oil. And to the extent that that can be replaced with cheaper um, vegetable alternatives, which are, there are experiments that are trying to do that, um, that could just decrease the cost of production of aquaculture and then increase it dramatically. Make things worse. So I'm not sure what our position is, frankly, on this topic. Yeah, no, that's a tough one. I, we could do an entire panel on that, um, and I would love to, but we're almost out of time. Uh, so in, in hopefully about 45 seconds each, um, what can the EA movement do to maximize our impact with regard to aquatic animal suffering uh, or anything else you would like to say in about 45 seconds for uh, the folks in the audience. Uh, and we'll go Sofika, Alex, and Andres. Perfect, thank you. Yes, so let's open our ears, let's come together, let's use the expertise from the land-based animal movement from the previous decades to rapidly scale up action in aquatic animal welfare. Many of the players are the same. Many of the um, strategies will be the same. Many of the relationships will be the same. It's just a new species that's getting introduced into the conversation. We need to invest in this space and stay closely coordinated. And uh, that, that will create um, the fastest, most positive change for all of these species. Thank you. Alex. I want to echo that actually, let's repl replicate some of the successes we've made when it comes to terrestrial animals. Um, and there we need this multi-pronged approach that includes um, having real alternatives that people like, that people like to buy, and alternative seafood has that potential. 1.5% um, meat sales um, in the US of the global, of the total meat sales is plant-based. 16% is plant-based dairy. We are at 0.1% for plant-based seafood. Let's make it 16%. All right, Andres. I agree with my co-panelists. We need to do, the EA movement just needs to do more of what it's already doing. Um, support uh, welfare-focused primary research, support organizations that are working on the, on the issue, um, support animal organizations that are working in the global south. Um, uh, yeah, basically that would be it. All right, so uh, trillions of wild-caught animals hundreds of billions of farmed animals, um, incredibly neglected. The work that you all are doing uh, and others feels really, really tractable um, and also super important. So clearly uh, a worthy EA cause area uh, that fits all the metrics. So thank you all very much for 
uh, coming along. Hope everybody has a wonderful uh, rest of your EA conference, and let's give a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.